Hey, uh, today we're going to learn how to care less. You guys ready for this? Specifically, when I'm talking about how to care less is how can we care less about what others think of us so we can care more for others? How do we care less about what others think of us and care more about what others might need from us? See, our worlds are dominated. This common life is dominated by us desperate to, valid, to validate ourselves by the approval of others. And it's like we chase this over and over and over in our world. I think there's a better way. I think there's an uncommon way to live as followers of Jesus. So join me. We're in Luke, uh, I'm sorry, not Luke. We're in John chapter 2 this morning. And we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 25. I'd like to start this morning just by reading this passage, and then we'll work through it and talk about some of the uh, pieces as we unpack what we're thinking about this morning. And we're starting in verse 13. You ready? It says this, John chapter 2, verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. And so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. So those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And the Jews then responded to him, what signs, that means like miracles, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three, uh, and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken about was actually his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And then they believe the scripture and the words that Jesus has spoken. So here's Jesus, uh, and, and, and John has it here. He comes into Jerusalem during the Passover, and he makes this pilgrimage that people did, uh, right? The, the Jewish people were scattered across the world, right, at this point. They were really far. So they would make this pilgrimage, some of them perhaps only once, a, uh, once in their lifetime. They'd make their pilgrimage to the temple, and this temple had several courts inside of it. And Jesus comes into the temple and he notices that people, I mean, there are cows and sheep and doves all being sold to, for sacrifices. Now, th th that is a service, but what people were doing, they were taking advantage of people, of others who had made their pilgrimage into the city. And you just see all these money changers and, and, and uh, people in the market trying to take advantage of the people. And, and it's like, he couldn't stand it any longer. And he sees people like money changers, and, and, and money changers are good, right? Like, we have to exchange money. Like, people are coming in from Italy. They've got a different coin, and so they come in, and they can, they can exchange the money. But the, they were being taken advantage of, right? And Jesus comes in, and, and sometimes we think of this story, and we're, we, we, we think, man, Jesus kind of lost it right there, right? Like, he just went berserk, and he just was overcome with anger, and he comes in, and he starts throwing over tables and clearing out stuff. I think there's one part of this story that, that I love, and I just want to bring out to you right here. It says in verse 13, so he made a whip out of cords. I love that phrase because it tells me this was not just losing it out of anger. It means that Jesus went out, and he found cords, <laughs> three or four of them, I don't know, and then he took the time to sit down and fashion a whip, right? What he did was not, I mean, it was righteous anger, but it was not uncontrolled violence at all, right? So he sits there, and I can just picture him creating this whip, and his disciples are like, what are you, what are you making there, Jesus? Uh, that, that looks tough. Is that what I think it is? Are you sure you want to do this? And he's probably contemplating, man, people are really going to be angry at me when I do this. Oh, well, I, this is what I got to do. I'm going to have to push these people out. I've got to get the cattle out, so I'm going to make this whip. So it's very calculated, righteous, anger. And he goes in, completely knowing that people are going to be upset with him, completely understanding the ramifications for what he's about to do, but he knows he has to do it because he serves God, not man. Keeps going. 
Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He didn't need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Okay, so how do we care less about what others think so we can care for others more? It's what we're talking about this morning. When I was in high school, uh, I can remember in our lunchroom, there were six tables in our lunchroom. We had, uh, it was simpler times back then. <laughs> we had the jock table, we had the nerd table, we had the preppy table, we had the farmer table, the goth table, and the stoner table. And as a freshman, you, and as a freshman, you kind of walked in, big-eyed, and just desperate to find your seat at any one of those tables, right? And all those tables, we had all of our people trying to be validated by one thing or the other, looking desperate for approval. For the jocks, they were seeking validation in the scope of their talent. For the nerds, and this is, I know this is not probably like PC now. This is what our, we used to call them back then. I'm sorry. I know it's not that way now in your, church, in your schools. It's, it's way more complicated, but these were simpler times. The jocks, their scope of their talent, they were seeking validation. The nerds were seeking validation in the capacity of their intellect. The preppy table, the cost of their jeans. The farmer table, the size of their truck tires. The goths, the depth of their eyeliner, right? And the stoners, the quality of their weed. (laughs) And here I was, trying to find my seat at one of these tables, like every other freshman. And I moved through high school, and finally I left, graduated somehow, they let me out, and I thought, man, I am so glad to be done with all that immaturity. Oh my gosh, so like, just the, the dynamics of all that, like, I'm just so glad to be done with it all. And then I came to this realization that we all do, that that same self-absorbed People-pleasing validation from others actually doesn't go away when we graduate high school, did it? No. It's just that the tables change. And in the end, it's this common life of not caring for others' needs because we're so busy caring about others' approval. It's what the world says, tells us. It's what we so often buy into. Even, even as followers of Jesus, we fall into this trap, right? How do we be free of this? What tables are you striving to sit at? It's pretty clear what happens when we, when we start chasing man's approval instead of God's. Number one, we start to validate. We seek approval in all the wrong places. We want a seat at that table at all costs. It makes us desperate for the approval of others, but it also makes us very quick to disprove of others as well. Sometimes we need a seat that somebody's already filled, right? Best way to, best way to get a seat at the table is to get somebody else out. So that means that we tend to appease people to their face and then we gossip behind their back. People who can't stop talking about themselves usually can't stop thinking I'm sorry, people who can't stop talking about others usually can't stop thinking about themselves. So we spend this life trying to validate ourselves, trying to pee, trying to, trying to uh, gain approval from others, from, from the people around us. And when we do that, when we get caught in that trap, the next step we validate and then we curate. We construct a persona of ourselves that we think other people want to see. This This fake image of ourselves that that we think we can sell so that we might gain that seat at the table. We filter our lives, right? Last week, my, uh, my youngest daughter took a picture of, my, of me and then started giggling. And I knew, as all of you with teenagers know, exactly what had happened. I had just been filtered, right? And the question wasn't like what crazy image, distorted image of my face she had just created. The question was how many hundreds of her friends had she just sent it to, right? (laughs) We live in a new day. We use filters 
our lives become inauthentic. They don't resemble what God had created. In other, in other words, uh, where others' praise is used to validate our personal achievements, it keeps us from maturing in our faith, growing as followers of Jesus, looking more like Him. So, when we validate from others, we start to curate and we start to use filters for our lives. Or, or, and this is really common in the Christian world, we either use filters or we have no filter. That's the other direction this could go. Making us disingenuous in our authenticity. Do you catch that? Where others' sympathy is used to validate our personal reactions rather than maturing in our faith and growing as followers of Jesus. In other words, we become like our grandpa at Golden Corral. It's like this. You go, you know, you, you, you go to meet your grandparents and you find your, there's Papa. Hi, Papa. It's been a long time. Good to see you. How are you? And he says, you know, I've got this growth on the small of my back. Have you seen it? It looks a lot like Salisbury steak. Take a look. You're like, Papa, I don't, may, this might not be the most appropriate place to share that. I think the good patrons of Golden Corral don't need to see your Salisbury steak. Maybe a, maybe a doctor would be appropriate, an appropriate person to show that to. In other words, instead of being completely filtered, we become totally unfiltered. And we're so needy of validation from others that we seek people's approval of our real and troubled lives rather than our fake lives. And it actually just becomes a cover, another cover that we employ once again to keep people at arm's length through a disingenuous authenticity and not having to actually mature in our faith and grow through the circumstances of our life. Our validation comes from others hearing our heart stories and sympathizing with us. Because at its root and the previous root still is us seeking the approval of men more than we seek the approval of God. So we validate and then we curate. And then what does that leave us? We isolate. We isolate ourselves from relationships that are both authentic or genuine. And it keeps us from caring and loving others with this uncommon grace that Jesus offers. In the end, we find ourselves sitting at the table we do so desperately wanted to sit at, but we sit there alone. Validation from others leads to curation of ourselves and isolation from others. When our validation comes from others, we curate false images of ourselves and isolate ourselves from others. That common life is not what you were created for. Jesus shows us a new way towards this uncommon life in him. Let's go back to John chapter 2. Okay, so uh, the last two verses, I think, are so telling of Jesus and how he walked through this world and how he calls us to walk in this world. It says this. Let's go back to it. It says in verse 23, now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Anybody else, like, not quite understand what that, that meant? Like, first time you read it, you're like, I, that sounds great. What did that mean? Let's go back. All right, look. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the signs he was performing, and look at this word right here. This is key. And believed in his name. That word, that word means to put our faith, to place our trust. It's the same word in the original language. Many of the people saw the signs and believed in his name, but Jesus, verse 24, is absolutely key. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them. For he knew all people. You know what that means? This word entrust. But Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to them. The word there, entrust, that in the original language, that is the same word as the previous word, believed. They're actually the same word. In other words, Jesus wasn't about to put his faith in man because he knew what man was all about. We knew that, it was, that they were going to let him down, that they're fickle. 
that that's not what he was created for. He knew that he had to put his faith in his heavenly father. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He didn't need testimony about mankind. He knew mankind. He created them. He watched them fall. He came to save them. Jesus did not put his trust in man. He put his trust in his heavenly father. That means that who he is isn't dependent on us. But who we are is completely dependent on who he is. It means that Jesus wasn't a people pleaser. He was a God pleaser. Who are you entrusting yourself to? Whose approval are you seeking to prop yourself up? What tables are we striving to sit at that Jesus would have overturned? So, we need some ways out of this, right? Here are three ways to begin to walk out of this, this life of just chasing the approval of man. Number one, here we go. Three ways to walk out of this life, this, this, this cycle of a common life. Number one, we seek the approval of God, not man. Galatians 1 says this, this Paul, am I now trying to win the approval of human, being, human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I, if, it were, I'm sorry, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. We must stop see, seeing ourselves through the lens of the approval of others, but in the fullness of how God sees us through the lens of the gospel. See, this common life is dictated by the approval of others. An uncommon life is validated from our Heavenly Father. God both fully knows you, the real you, and fully loves you as well. So number one, we stop. We stop seeking the approval of, of man and start seeing, seeking the approval of God. Number two, we entrust. Remember that word from John 2? We entrust our lives in the gospel of Jesus. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Listen to this. For those, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Right here, look at this to be conformed to the image of his son, capital S, exclamation point. When we entrust our lives in Christ, we know that in all things, he is at work conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus. If, if we are foreknown, then we are predestined. And if we are predestined, then we're called. If we're called, then we're justified. If we're justified, then we will also be glorified, it says. So, if, if the common life strives to, to curate this false image of oneself, the uncommon life is being conformed to the image of Christ. Okay? So one, seek the approval of God, not man. Two, be conformed to the image of Christ. And number three, we invest with transparency and authenticity and genuosity. My wife keeps telling me that's not a word, but I'm going with it. <laughs> As followers of Jesus, we want an uncommon life. Following him, serving our heavenly father, audience of one, however you want to put it. So we risk it, we live it, and we love it. We walk with transparency with one, authenticity with a few, and genuosity, genuineness. Okay, you like that one better? With everybody. So risk it. Become transparent with one, your heavenly Father. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, Colossians says. 
We got to have this one down. We got to get this one right. Before you can do anything else, this one has to come first. Are you spending time with Jesus daily, investing in that relationship first? Be transparent with one. And then that equips us to live it so that we can be authentic with just a few. We begin to take real steps into intimacy and community with others. Invest. Engage. Join a life group. Right? We just saw the, the, the average. We're launching these life groups. Yes, do that. Take this faith, this journey of faith in community seriously. It takes investing in that. Risk it, become transparent with one, live it, be authentic with a few, and finally, love it. When we're doing those things, we, our lives start to get in the right order. It allows us to love it. it. allows us to become genuine with everybody, with, with the people that we meet, our neighbors, our friends, the people who we play ball with, the people that we go to school with, the people that we work beside. allows us to engage in the world around us freely when we're not trying to find our worth from what others think of us. It allows us to influence, but not with this ulterior agenda. It allows us to influence us as, as, as we are the aroma of Christ. It allows us to invest because our eyes are fixed on things above. So, May we set our minds on things above. Because if I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you free us from this, this need to validate ourselves just by others' whims and fickleness. Lord, I pray that you would meet us where we are this morning. Father, we, we want to please you and not men. Forgive us when we get that backwards. Father, would you help us to care less about ourselves, what people think about us, Lord? And would you, would you equip us to walk freely, engaging, influencing, investing, Lord, with you as our one. We serve at your pleasure. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.